carry out fiscal and monetary policy. They're instruments of the same genre. And in civilized societies, they should be used in the pursuit of maximum welfare of the community. How you blend the two instruments is an analytical issue, an empirical issue, and also a governance issue. And I will come on to the governance issue in a moment. But analytically speaking, you have two, two toolkits two tools in the toolkit, but the job to be accomplished is maximum welfare of the community, which is a very practical matter. It starts with maximum possible employment, <laughs> maximum possible employment. That is not the only objective of macro policy. I personally happen to believe that distributions of outcomes in our society matter. I happen to be a small D Democrat. I'm also about a large D Democrat. <laughs> but I start being a small D Democrat, meaning that I think democracy which is founded upon the principle of one person, one vote, can appropriately consider the distribution of the fruits of the village to be a relevant optimization variable. Democracies can rightfully and morally and without apology talk about the distribution of income, in my viewpoint. One, because it's rational from a moral perspective. But two, very practical. It matters for aggregate demand management. It matters for aggregate demand management. In fact, if it didn't matter for aggregate demand management, I'd be standing on much weaker ground. I really would be. If it didn't matter for aggregate demand management, then you could, I think immorally, but that's a value judgment, you could rationally say, let them eat cake. It doesn't matter. Let them eat cake, however, is not just morally wrong, which again is a value judgment. It is macroeconomically wrong. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Because if let them eat cake becomes your macro compass, you will drive the ship onto the shoals of inadequate aggregate demand for the simple reason poor people have a higher propensity to consume than rich people. That simple. So we think in terms of macro as a core discipline to be optimized for the village. And the key issue for the village is the demand side of the economy or to borrow from Agri Smith, if there is demand, the supply side, as if by an invisible hand, will figure out how to meet it. <laughs> demand is the chicken. Supply is the egg. I've answered the riddle for you. Somebody tell Merkel. Uh, <laughs> so you want to use your tool to maximize demand consistent with full employment. And therefore, distribution of income matters as well. Conceptually, 
the sovereign can use fiscal policy, which is known as the power to tax, or it can use monetary policy, which is the power to declare that which will be legal tender. Both are incredibly awesome powers. <laughs> awesome powers. They have many similar characteristics. If someone can tax you, they have a rather large impact on your life. <laughs> If someone by fiat can declare that which can be used to extinguish a debt, including the taxes that you owe, including the taxes that you owe, that's also a very awesome power. So first principle number two, there are only three here, so I'm about two-thirds finished. First principle number two is analytically, do not get trapped into a cul-de-sac of lazy thinking that somehow monetary and physical policy are inherently separate instruments. And the notion that monetary and physical policy coordination is an abomination against God and mankind Don't get caught in that cul-de-sac. It's just flat out wrong. And that's highly relevant to where we are right now in practical terms when we look at the global economy. And here in a act of blatant marketing of my own work, I retired two and a half years ago, as Dimitri noticed, noted. And I've written two major, I think, scholarly articles since I retired with a delightful young man, Zoltan Posnar. And both are about monetary and fiscal policy coordination. Uh, so this is an area where I'm not just talking off the cuff. I've done a great deal of scholarly work. I think that's the forefront of where global macro needs to be right now is open, frank, robust, analytical discussion of coordination and knocking down of the canard that central bank independence is written in the scriptures. It wasn't. God did not create on the eighth day central bank independence just didn't. But don't say that too loud or else people think you're a heathen. <laughs> Believe me, I've been called a heathen on this score and I got a feeling the second row here has been called a heathen a few times as well. Okay, third principle. A big idea of what I'm going to talk about as the third element to kick off this conference. I want to get the first two down. First principles. Okay. I'll tell on my third element. Banking. Banking. Conventional banking, shadow banking, shadow shadow banking. Banking is inherently a joint venture between the public sector and the private sector. The key thing I just said is inherently a joint venture between the public sector and the private sector. Anybody who talks about private sector banking in the modern day world as a solution to that which ails us, doesn't know what they're talking about. That 
and simple. Why, and here I'm going to get to core principles, why is public, why is banking inherently a public private sector venture? Let's go back to principle number one, <laughs> the paradox of aggregation. Tying this together for you. I'm almost finished, promise. Banking from time immemorial is founded on a very simple proposition. The public, here the public is a aggregated term, the village. The villages ex ante demand for liquidity is always greater than the village's ex post demand for liquidity. Why is that the case? It underscores the fundamental difference between micro and macro. At the micro level, you as an individual want to know that you can go to your bank and have your deposit turned into what we call in the United States a dead president, which is legal tender declared by the sovereign. At the micro level, you want to know that you can do that. So you have a demand for liquidity. I want these things for my deposit. You, at the individual level, want it. So if you were to look at banking as simply the summing up of everybody's demand for these things, you wouldn't have any banking. Because we would simply all have all of our wealth in these things, in self-assuring, self-insuring our liquidity preference, which is inherently risk adverse. So summing up micro demands from liquidity, for liquidity, to create a village level ex ante demand for liquidity is one construct. But if the village commits to having a banking system that is a going concern, then by definition, you don't want these things. The village's ex post demand for liquidity is below the summing up of the village's individual demands for liquidity before the fact. Everyone follow me here? This is really important stuff. Ex ante is greater than ex post most of the time. <laughs> most of the time, which means that banks are in the middle between ex ante and ex post and can engage in what technically is known as maturity, credit, and liquidity transformation. Banks can promise that which they cannot deliver. 